Well, sure. uh, Jason, thank you so much for helping my project. Could you say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I run a process improvement uh, and data science business called StarTech uh, behind us. We help um, startups in the space industry who need help positioning and with business development. Uh, and we help established companies do what they do better. Um, and that may sound simple, but you're uh, fighting against inertia there and we've always done it this way. And that's kind of an emergency sound. If you hear that in your business, we've always done it this way. Then you should come talk to us. Yeah, it's a, a big problem um, because obviously they've gotten by with what they were doing, but they're not going to be able to grow or change or adapt if, if they keep doing it. So mm -hmm. what are some of the techniques you you use in order to get people to overcome sort of that being caught in a rut? Oh, most of the time they don't have anything written down. And uh, if something isn't written down, then it 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 really hasn't happened. Like if you and I solve a problem, but we don't tell anybody else about it or have it, the information about it somewhere findable uh, that we're, where other people working with us could find out about it, then it just didn't happen basically. So, uh, so writing things down um, and it sounds again, simple, but documentation is something that a lot of people want to just rush past in their, um, in their, in their, fight or rush to get to the end result. And that doesn't lead to being a learning organization. Uh, if you don't see what you did, then you can't uh, look at it and, and do it any better. Um, I was having a conversation with another um, podcast host in the space field yesterday, uh, and he's familiar with process improvement and that, and um, had used it in his own career and had some great examples of um, coming up with uh, 14 different processes in his, uh, you know, department in, in the company that he was working at. And he, once he wrote them down, he was able to see all the repeats, uh, you know, of, of people doing the same stuff here and there and cut them down to three. So, you know, you can think about the increase in capacity. Um, it's not about firing people. It's about giving them better work. Yeah. That makes hundred percent sense. Um, in fact, I, I think a lot of people just get comfortable going through the motions of work without actually keeping an eye on what the whole point of it all is. And that seems to um, you know, provide some type of um, resistance to writing it down and documentation, uh, job security too. Uh, if you yeah. have to come to me to be able to figure out what I'm doing, then that makes it a little right. bit harder to reorg. Right. And that's just not good leadership <laughs> in that case. Uh, if, and, and unfortunately, this is a situation that founders um, and CEOs are too often in, which is the firefighting position. Um, and it's very easy to look at that tire fire in front of you. It's very bright. It's smoky. It's loud. It smells. Everyone can see it and think that that's where you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck. Uh, and on the Cold Star Project in season one, I've got an episode about, um, you know, finding the biggest bang for your buck in, in your business, and it's not there. Um, your business has been operating the entire time while that tire fire has been burning. And what should that tell you, right? Uh, and, and for those who can't make the leap, uh, it means that that tire fire has absolutely nothing to do with the capacity or the pipeline flow of production in your business. Um, the place to look is something that you think you've already taken care of. And, and you know, just thinking about uh, launch technologies and, and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, some of the earlier launches are more risky on one hand because, um, you know, you're, you're trying something new. But on the other hand, it's uh, you have people paying complete attention to every little detail, but then you start getting to the operational mode and, uh, you know, you, you may have the process down, but you, you don't have the same attention to detail. And that's whenever you start running into maybe some some issues like we've had in the past. It's possible. I mean, it's for, for some companies who have had launch failures recently, I haven't looked inside their businesses, so I can't say. Um, you look at a, a SpaceX and uh, they have operational excellence and it shows, right? When you can get a rocket up in space in, in under 20, 25 minutes and launch 60 satellites, it's pretty impressive, right? I'm not a SpaceX fanboy, but uh, I know excellence when I see it. And there it is. So, and, uh, and they do, I do know they have good systems at SpaceX. So 
um, they're they're definitely collecting data and looking at it and seeing how can we do better. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. You know, we talk about all the technology spinoffs uh, that we hope to get from our space program, which was definitely evident with Apollo. But you know, the the technologies that are being used in mission control today and uh, what have you are, are decades old, uh -huh. and they're they're not bleeding age, edge. In fact, they're not even up to date. Uh, so it's it's really difficult to see what kind of spinoffs we would get from the space program that, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it would be like it would be with Apollo. I was just... Yeah, you think, Nathan, um, that there's kind of a pyramid and, and some new technology like heat shield tiles or something comes out and then, uh, oh, that gets released into the sort of the public domain and, uh, gee, look at all the places we can use it in that. But I actually looked into this um, a few years ago and there have been studies that have been done about is there that trickle down effect of technology? And it's again, it's not as impactful, according to these studies, as uh, we would hope. So I don't see that as a great motivator for doing things as a function or, or um, not a means unto itself. I guess that wouldn't be the right wording, but platform for, for economies, right? Uh, being able to make stuff in orbit in ways that we can't because of, of uh, free fall. I don't want to say zero gravity because uh, more uh, will come after me. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> You I'm know, glad to see bringing this stuff uh, back down that we've made up there in those environments, crystals, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to see more of us uh, made an impact. Uh, it's like that... we're having a bit of an internet connection issue. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's been quite influential. I got turned on to him by a former uh, space development agency director. And uh, it's been a year, year and a half of good conversations ever since. Um, so... Yeah, I, I, I do believe that we are going to um, have great uh, improvements and, and expansions in economies uh, because of what we can do in space. But I don't see that trickle down uh, of, of technology. I mean, what do you, in terms of us going to the moon, say in 2024, probably closer to 2026, really? Yeah. Um, Oh, what do you see as being the benefit of that, if any? Hmm. So on, on the, the grand gesture level, I believe it's important uh, as, as a symbol. Um, it's important. Uh, humanity left to itself, I believe, would sit on its butt and, uh, and want nice meals and to be pampered, taken care of kind of thing. And uh, so this gives us a, a symbolic opportunity to, to reach for something. Um, and it is a challenge. It's, it's something we haven't done in a long time. It requires, um, in some cases, technology that got lost, right? That, that hand forged uh, engine type stuff, right? That where um, we've got to figure out how to do it again. And I, I, you know, it's, it's, as you say, the 2024 goal was uh, laudable, but uh, not realistic from the beginning. And all of this is dependent on congressional funding, right? That's, that's really the key here. And that comes from uh, leadership prioritization. What, what goals do we have? So does the administration buy into uh, going to the moon as a great symbol um, and, and a, 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 uh, a need for America to, and the other parties that are associated with it um, to make this kind of a gesture, right? What are we going to get out of it? I don't know. Um, I think it's important regardless, because it means we're not just sitting around getting fat on our own planet. Uh, and, and we are trying to do something and get out there into the galaxy and, um, and find out what's out there. So, yeah. Some people talked uh, about us going to the moon as um, proof that we had done it before and, um, you know, you got like the um, social and political aspects of it, um, but uh, a lot of people I talk to ask, you know, what do we hope to get out of it? Uh, their concerns are more with, you know, curing disease or global climate change, and and they're they're struggling to see kind of like the connection or or maybe the relative importance of these things. Right. Um, again, it's all about prioritization and, and where do you want to point humanity at? I believe that that's a non sequitur, that whole idea of why are we doing stuff in space when we could be doing stuff down on the planet? I don't believe it's an either or thing. 
Um, I believe in abundance. I believe in uh, uh, unlimited resources, basically. If we, if we have the will to do something, we can do it. And we can do it a lot faster. So t- tremendous waste in government spending. We know this. Uh, it's not hyperbole. Uh, that um, that can be cleaned up and money can be found for anything. Remember the the space program. I remember Carl Sagan writing about this, talking about this. Right, one destroyer for the U.S. Navy, and I'm not picking on the Navy, uh, costs more than the the space program. Right, so it's a question of priorities again. Where do we want to put uh, our money? And it's not guns or butter. It's not uh, this or that. It's, uh, it's what do we actually want to achieve here? And frankly, um, we, can, we can provide housing for people, for example, but we can't raise their consciousness. They have to do that on their own. We can show them the path uh, and hope that they take it and, and maybe encourage them in that and give them uh, better conditions. But just because you give somebody a handout um, doesn't mean that it's going to really improve their lives. They, they may spend it um, uh, um, from Vancouver, uh, originally I moved to the U.S. about 12 years ago and they have a program there where they'll give uh, certain people houses and I know I have known some of those people and you give them the house and, and it's a new house and within two or three years that house looks like their old house hmm. it's in the same condition um, and so there's, there's more to it than just uh, taking money from one pot and, and handing it out. And then, uh, oh, that's going to fix everything. That's just not true. So uh, investment in the space program is a, a useful symbol. It's a, um, a journey that we need to make. I believe it's useful. And it's symbolic for humanity that we're just not sitting here on, on our butts. Uh, you mentioned having the abundance mindset, and that's mm. something that I'd like to point out uh, to a lot of people is that the first time we went to the moon, we only had 3.5 billion people on the earth. Now we have close uh, more than 7 billion. Mm-hmm. A lot of people look at that as being 7 billion mouths that need to be fed and people that need to be uh, housed, but that's 7 billion brains that could be solving problems. Right, right. right. What opportunities, Jerry, are you giving them and uh, what... what um... What infrastructure do you have? So better projects, actually, this is this is a good segue into that. Better projects is a, is a way to uh, get people working on better ideas, right? If if the access to projects that people have is should I be a hairdresser or work at Walmart in their town, and that's the level that they can get to, uh, that's one level of economic development, and it's certainly not the highest best use of of an individual. Uh, and the best projects will fight it out at the top, right? And, and get, uh, you know, it's, it's a sales job at that point. There is marketing involved and uh, the, best, the best ideas will win out. But a better project, like how can I be involved in, uh, in, in Artemis and, and get people to the moon? Um, that's a lot better. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a much higher goal to strive for. And even if you don't get to be a part of that exact program, uh, being on its periphery and being involved and creating value and making money uh, and, and getting the education and all that stuff, everything that's tied up in that process is certainly better than, uh, than being stuck at a $10 an hour type role. Absolutely. And but a lot of that comes from our educational system. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've trained people very well just to sit in class and be quiet and scribble things on papers and, uh, yeah. you know, to try to get the answer that's most consistent with what's expected, but not to really think or to produce or to create or to organize. Um, I mean, to what extent do you see kind of like our public education system as, as being something that's holding us back? Yeah. Now I have to say again, and I'm going to sound elitist and um, privileged, and I am, I guess. Uh, you know, I was born in a, a very nice city in a very nice part of the world, and and just got plugged accidentally into things. Um, I didn't go through the American system. I went through the Canadian system. I didn't see racism uh, up close until I moved to the United States. Uh, I'm sure there is latent racism in, in Canada, but you see it uh, a lot faster. Uh, up here in uh, in North Carolina, for example, 
Um, so I can't speak to what American students learned, but I do know that the Canadian uh, system is fairly similar. It's, it's about sitting in classes, uh, being orderly, regurgitating memorized information. Uh, it's not really about problem solving. That being said, I had some great teachers who, who I remember um, very well, who shaped uh, my outlook and my belief in myself that I could go do things. Um, so there are, there are great teachers out there. Uh, but yeah, uh, um, again, this is the, we're, we're in a conversation now about school boards and politics and whatnot. <laughs> That's pretty far outside the realm. I think, you know, everything does leave because there'll be people who listen to this and go, Jason, you're, you're a jerk. You're full of it. If you're, if you're feeling that way, because uh, they put you into a box, How, you can step out of that at any time and say, no, I'm going to chart a new direction. Uh, and then probably have to go pick some new friends to, uh, to help you do that. Nobody does anything alone. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll agree with you that uh, the education system is something that needs to be looked at. And I guess, uh, you know, uh, in terms of going to the moon, most of the people that aren't in space that I've talked to have no clue that we're going. Um, you know, they, some of them think, um, you know, NASA's been shut down or... Um, some even think we've, that's where we've always been going. Every time they see humans launched into space, it's like, where else are they going? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, um, I, I've heard kind of like the, the gamut. Uh, some say, you know, they, they knew that something was in the works, but uh, they didn't know there was a specific like plan or deadline. Um, I guess, um, you know, back in 1969, whenever Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, if you're on the three network television stations are in the one or two city newspapers, pretty much everybody knew whatever that thing was. Mm -hmm. But today, I mean, other than the pandemic, I doubt there's anything that's globally, that has global attention or, or is widely known. Yeah, right. And um, I mean, how does, how does NASA kind of go out there and, and, get deeper engagement from the community uh, without uh, being called in like the NASA bubble. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know about a bubble, but uh, yeah, sure. There's, there's uh, more platforms and more distribution channels for messaging than ever before. There's also uh, as a result of that, more opportunities for distraction, right? I can go watch somebody play through a video game instead of learning about NASA, right? Or I can go to Scott Manley's channel and do both. So, <laughs> there is, you know, pick, pick your friends wisely, right? Is, um, so, yeah, you, you know, there is an issue there. I, I really, you know, people, people need to be inspired. People need to be inspired. And that's why I, I talk about uh, Artemis and going to the moon as a, as a symbolic thing. Okay, because it's ins inspirational. And I'm sorry we had to get, uh, you know, 16, 17 minutes into this conversation to hit to at this point. But I think uh, finally I'm able to articulate what I mean here. And so it's, it is uh, NASA's job and, and the government's job uh, in supporting it to market this idea, this symbol, right? And inspire people or some kind of exchange needs to happen where we can promote um, this, this mission and maybe some kind of incentive too to this topic and get rewarded for doing so. Make it, make it um, uh, an incentive to talk about it, right? So I think it's important. And you point out a, a, a key thing. You know, I'm interested in the food industry. I'm interested in trucking and, and distribution and that. Uh, are you up to date on what's going on, you know, in those fields? So, I have no right? clue. It's like you kind of, okay, I'm going to focus on this, and this is what I'm going to pay attention to going on with the, the NASA program, right? It's a, it's a niche thing, and that's okay. We, we, um, every time somebody gives me that non sequitur thing, why, why are we going into space instead of feeding people or something like that? I say, do you like your GPS on your phone? And 100% of the time, that stops that line of, uh, <laughs> of conversation, right? We end up talking about something more positive. Um, because there is something in it for you. There is something in it for you. You know, I said that trickle down thing wasn't so um, so impactful as we'd like it to be earlier. But there are uh, transformational things like GPS that uh, that get embedded into our lives and we don't even notice. Right? We don't even notice. I can remember uh, in 2011 
having a general manager job where I was driving around in rural North Carolina and I'd been given this giant roadmap and I would look in there to figure out how to get to where I wanted to go. And I would take that big map and I would um, kind of remember the streets and the turns that I needed to go to. And I would take uh, the back of a receipt or something, a little piece of paper and draw the streets, go down here, turn right here, et cetera, and the names, right? And then as I drove, I would look at that scrap of paper and go, okay, I'm looking for this road and I'm going to turn left on it. And that's my next thing, right? And then now, of course, we've got, we've had smartphones for long enough uh, that we just accept it. Um, so, uh, you know, part of uh, one of the slogans for, for uh, Cold Star Tech is make space boring. And that doesn't mean dull and uninteresting. It means that, that level of user adoption where people are going to space jobs and buying space-based products and services and using these services in a way that it's like, duh, you know, like how, obviously, right? Well, at one point it wasn't obvious. It, it, it became that over time. And so... Um, this mission is symbolic of, uh, of that sort of thinking. And um, so who knows what it's going to turn into at the end. I think it's a valuable, worthwhile, useful, practical um, investment. And you know, we definitely need to go. Um, one other hope that I hope we get out of going to the moon and, and beyond is I feel like so much discovery and invention starts out as a gut feeling or flash of insight. Sure. And since the majority of humans live, you know, 24 hour day, uh, one geogravity, one atmosphere of pressure, I just wonder whenever we start putting humans on a regular basis in environments outside that, not just like six or seven around the International Space Station, but hundreds and thousands of humans, you know, if there's some things that become obvious to us that, uh, that, that we're kind of blinded just because, you know, like a fish doesn't know what water is type mm -hmm. of situation. Well, I'm certainly not a health expert. Uh, we could talk about biorhythms and circadian rhythms and sleep cycles and the like. We'll point out a fellow like Dr. Jim Pass, who has, um, he'll, he'll have to come up with consistently thinking about uh, what is a society in another place other than Earth going to look like? Because uh, if it is a permanent settlement, and even if it's not actually, if, if, it's, if it's permanent enough, i.e. maybe the the individuals don't stay there forever and they do cycle back and come and go on that. There will be a culture over there and it will be weird, right? They will adopt norms and they will, they will do things that are normal to them because they're in that environment that will go, wow, really, really? They sleep 6.2 hours a night and that's good enough, you know, and, and they eat broccoli all the time. Wow. You know, cause that's, that's what they grow. I don't know, but these things will develop and there will be a veering off of that culture from from the norms of, of earth and even on earth of course there are uh different norms if i was to go to nigeria there would be completely different norms uh from where i am in, in north america and there again versus uh, uh siberia or something right where the way people live and the priorities that they have are uh, are related to the environment. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to see if, uh, an effect from that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's going to be, I hope I live long enough to see some of it. If it was safe and affordable, would you go to space? Short answer. Yes. Long answer. No, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not keen on it. I'm not interested in space tourism myself. Uh, I want to um, supply and, and, and traffic control the pieces of the things, running the stoplights and uh, and fixing the the sewers and that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing uh, that that I'm interested in. Um, would I go to the moon if it were safe and and uh, it was like taking an air trip today? I'm not a big fan as little as possible. Um, not because I don't trust the planes or the designers, uh, but because on the one chance in a million that there is a problem, you're pretty much dead. And I don't need an insta fail like that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I, I would go just out of curiosity, I think. But uh, yeah, again, we're a long way. Um, have you heard of a, a project called Space Hero? No. Um, so it's no, a. Tell me about it. It was a, a worldwide reality TV show contest that's uh, going to launch this year. Mm. Uh, the the winner of which gets to go to the International Space Station uh, for ten days. 
Okay. I, um, so what do you, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to attract people who want to go. So good. <laughs> they're they're going to be enthusiastic about it. Um, what, what kind of talents do they have to uh, demonstrate in order to, um, to qualify and to compete? I, I don't know. That hasn't been announced yet. Um, okay. But I have talked to a, a number of uh, people in the space industry, and they're a little doubtful of sending a virtual reality TV star to the International Space Station. Um, you know, because you have professional astronauts up there doing their thing. I, I was thinking the solution there is uh, the 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 winner uh, should be judged on their ability to do science and kind of participate in the not necessary activities in space and actually be a contributing part of the crew. Sure. Yeah, why, why not? Um, I've talked to mission planners on my show and uh, those guys uh, organize their time and they've got um, downtime. They've got, they can be matched up with somebody who, who shows up there. So that's not impossible uh, to achieve. Again, yeah, what, how much planning do you want to do ahead of time? <clears throat> um, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you're going to get some whiny kid bus tripped up there to sit in the, the the copula for a while look out the window and then come back down uh i don't think that's going to be the case whoever whoever wins is is uh, going to be a fit for going and i think people know how to not be in the way um when they when they want to be um i i should mention more about jaw uh, he's one of their representatives for this project mm. okay so yeah I'll um, probably see more, but puts out so much stuff that uh, I can't follow everything that he does. But uh, I see him more than most people because I'm connected to him on three social media <laughs> platforms. And uh, yeah, so I see something from him every day. Well, I really appreciate your time. Is there anything that sure. you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? I think we're good. Uh, you know, space... I'm I'm all for the commercial side of the space industry, uh, which is very nascent. Um, there's a lot of great founders out there who have wonderful technical ideas, but no customers yet. And again, make space boring. We need to move that to where they do have customers. The business models are understood. Uh, investors can is safely from outside the space sector uh, invest in space. I just recently had a paper published uh, on the... Um, uh, the subject of space investing that I can link to um, and what the challenges are bringing in money from outside the space sector, because they, they those folks tend to uh, invest by magazine article, a nice launch picture. I'll put money in that as, a, as one space sector venture capitalist pointed out in, uh, in clear imagery. So uh, I, you know, we do need to get to that point. And I'm excited to work with uh, with folks in the commercial space industry uh, who have an idea of what they're about and where they want to go. Well, that sounds good. Well, I thank you so much for the work that you do over there at CodeStar Technologies and helping people to do process improvement, especially in the space sector. Um, it's um, I, I think uh, great things are in store for our future, and you know it's about continuing to pursue them. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll certainly have been around, Nathan, uh, for when these guys uh, get into their uh, big boy companies and, and realize, you know, oh, wow, we need the help now and, uh, and the infrastructure and that. So thanks for having me on. Well, um, you have a good rest of your day and All talk right. to you soon.